Let's go. <laughs> okay. Being agile, we're very timely. And we're back. All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So my name is Adam Ash. That's James Kutz. That's Chris Herring. We're from NBC Universal, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we each do. But the uh, topic that we're speaking about today is really on what we've learned over the last year and a half, two years of trying to move our organization onto uh, the Drupal platform, a centralized Drupal platform for everybody. Before we started doing this, uh, different parts of our company, and we'll talk about that a little bit, were each on their own either platform or instance of Drupal or uh, custom platform. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is they were on lots of different <laughs> content managers. That's true. And as an organization, the decision was made to really make a push for going to one centralized platform that we could take advantage of as an organization. And being a, an extremely large organization, which we'll talk about momentarily, we've encountered many, many challenges that we uh, have com come up with ways to address, starting with the beginning of our projects. And what we very often see, and I think that a lot of folks have this same experience, is when we start projects, and we had started projects in the past, our partners and the people that we're going to work with right away feel like their thing is the most unique and interesting thing in the world. And one centralized platform couldn't really address their needs. That uh, most times when we start any project with any client or any partner, right away they are thinking that that is something that isn't possible. Um, a lot of folks come into our first initial meetings with a picture, or they go out to get a design before even starting the project, and they hand it to us and say, here, just build that. How hard could it be? Right? And then, of course, we all get the question is, is it done? Pretty much from the initial meeting, right? Okay, now that you know we want a website, is it done? And so... And why, why isn't it? <laughs> and why isn't it? <laughs> and so these are kind of the things that we have learned to address on a very high level, and we'll go into a little more detail. So who are we, and uh, what do we do? I think um, most people in the room have heard of NBC Universal, but I think this slide illustrates our challenge pretty, pretty succinctly, which is unlike, you know, um, one of these brands building a platform or a content management system for one site, we have the unique challenge of building not only a platform, but a process that can scale for all of these sites. And we're not talking about, um, we can talk about this in a little bit more detail later, but I don't necessarily mean just like a hosting challenge or, or a performance challenge. I mean the challenge of sharing modules or, or function functionality between sites. That's something that's very difficult to do in a large organization <coughs> like ours because each of these brands think that they are unique in one way or another. And they are, of course. And uh, they are. <laughs> and we love them. And we love their uniqueness. But They're always listening. Yeah. They're, yes. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, what we've learned over the years, and not just the last two years, but we, the, the three of us and our entire team have many, many, probably dozens of decades of years collectively of experience building websites, is that if you strip away the Chrome and the design, the functionality is very much the same across a lot of sites you know, on the internet and almost all of our sites within the company. So this goes into a little bit about what each of us do and how we actually address this problem. So starting up a pro uh, the, the project is really a critical part. And so what we found and, and kind of the theme for today is really um, we the way we've addressed the, the most critical places to uh, make our project successful. And this kind of leads into a little bit about what each of us do. So in the organization, I'm responsible for the process we follow. Chris is responsible for the platform we build on. And James is responsible for the implementations on the platform executing this. Uh, so um, we've addressed each of these things within our process, but each of us really own a piece of this. So when we're talking about the process, we're talking about the roles and responsibilities of the people that are on the teams we put together and the control mechanisms we put in place for actually following our process. We're talking about building a foundational core platform, and we call it the core team and the core platform. And we actually call it Publisher 7. It's our version of Drupal 7. Copyright Chris Aaron. <laughs> and, and Chris 
<laughs> yes. And, and, and James is responsible for the execution of this. So James really is feeling the brunt of our partner's needs and desires all of the time because he's really at the forefront of actually making these things happen for them. That's right. But actually, with a clear process, a good platform, my job essentially is pretty easy. So, Which he'll tell you after yeah. the... <laughs> he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we did was look at actually what our core platform will be, and Chris is responsible for that platform. Yeah, so the team that I manage for the company is responsible for building this product, which we call Publisher Core. Um, and the thing that's interesting that you're going to hear about today is we use the same process that we're talking about today, not only just for building the sites that we mentioned earlier for all of those brands, but we use that same process for building this product. And the products, um, the products built on Drupal 7, obviously, but what we do is we focus on core functionality that is common across the company. Common things like um, editorial workflow, that's very common for scheduling, previewing, publishing, and syndicating content within the company or externally. Um, common functionality <coughs> like integration with third parties for analytics and content distribution and um, video management, for example. So we want to build those common areas of functionality in the form of typically Drupal modules, by the way, um, and make them available for all brands. So when Publisher is installed for the first time and made available for a brand on our hosting platform, all of that functionality, it just needs to be configured. And usually it's just a simple configuration screen where you're putting in your keys that enable that functionality for your brand. Um, but that's the job of the platform and, and of this team. So as you can see, when we start doing a project, already out of the box, we have some standardizations that we're starting to work with. So the first thing we did when we were applying this, as Chris alluded to, was we had to come up with a process that works within the organization, but then works across our partner platform implementations as well. And so uh, we started actually applying uh, Agile methodologies into the organization a few years ago. And what we've done over time, we started basically with uh, kind of a scrum framework. And then over time, we actually applied more and more Lean and Kanban and other Agile methodologies that help us actually manage projects within the organization. It's a complex organization. One methodology doesn't necessarily <coughs> scale across everything we need to do. So what we've done is we've created an Agile framework, an Agile process that we apply to doing this. So on the bottom row here is our Agile project, SDLC, or life cycle. Uh, and basically, those are the phases. And we're not going to go into those in detail today. But just to get an idea that we go through multiple phases that address specifically how to successfully start a project through how do we successfully deliver and measure what it is that we've delivered. We'll talk about some of those things today. Those are the critical things to actually what we're doing today. But at a high level, what we're really always addressing is what you see at the top, which is critically doing a great job of defining what we're doing, delivering the value and the benefit of what we're going to do, delivering uh, benefit and value, and then measuring ben and benefit and value. And so throughout the life cycle of our projects, we're always looking to do one of those things. And those are the three things we're basically focusing on to make sure that we are successful each time. The goal of all of the, our process is really to reduce the risk of failure. That doesn't mean we won't, but it means we're, we're, we've learned, at least in our organization, how to try to address that. So uh, basically, when we're getting into the defining phase, um, you're going to see a theme here where we basically start at a really high level, and then we start breaking it down. So one of the first things we like to do when we're starting to work with our brands is really start to identify, first of all, what are they going to leverage from our core Publisher 7 platform? Um, what's going to be uh, custom work, and in some cases, what are we going to develop as part of the project that's going to go back and become part of our core product because other brands are interested in it or we think it might scale out to those brands. So these are some things that we're going to identify pretty much you know, right in the beginning of the project. We're also going to look at, on both sides, once we sort of define whether something is going into the backlog of our core team or whether it's going into our implementation team, at both ends we want to start to get an idea of you know, how long this thing's going to take. What is it? How big is it? How complex is it? And we want to start getting high-level estimates. The nice thing about 
working in a common platform and having some experiences with some similar brands is that you know a lot of this is uh, repeatable. So, and we're also, we'll get into this a little bit, but we're also working with teams and those teams have a little bit of history. But even if we're spinning up a team, we can start to talk about this um, at a high level and get a feel for you know, what is the complexity just given our own experiences and the experiences of other teams within our group. Yeah, I think the important part here just to add is that just because we're doing an agile uh, development process um, doesn't mean that we don't estimate and try to project how long a project is going to take. I think a lot of our brands think agile, I don't have to plan, and it's really quite the opposite. We, do, we do more planning than we ever thought we were going to. Absolutely, and, yeah. And, and that's one of the critical issues that we address all the time, one of the key misconceptions of doing agile, first of all, but also that um, good project management is good project management, regardless of the methodology you're following. And it's always really important to understand that any customer, any partner we have, really what's important to them is when are they going to get what they're going to be getting, number one. But number two, I think it's a misconception that Agile doesn't work well with deadlines. And we work in an industry where you could imagine has very, very strict, unmovable deadlines. When a TV show is going to premiere on the network, it's, they're not going to wait a day because we don't have the website up. <laughs> when a movie's coming out, they're not going to delay the premiere because something's not right. Can't so, move the Olympics. And we can't move the Olympics, believe me. So, you know, those are the kind of things that we address all the time that, yes, so, so what we've actually done, and, and we'll talk about that throughout, is managing by scope, but also determining what the value of things is. So I talked about our approach where we start really high level and we start breaking it down. One of the first things we want to do when we're talking with the brand is get their vision. So in the past, we might, and many of you might experience this, you know, our brands come to us um, and they say, you know, build me a website. And that's sort of their vision. I want a website at the end of the day. Well, there's a lot more to that. And so we'll run an exercise where we'll actually dig into. This is actually what you're seeing here is actually the outcome of one of our exercises, which is we actually want them as a brand, the, you know, sort of the stakeholders to get together and, and agree upon what the vision is for the project. You know, and that vision will carry out throughout the project and really aligns everybody um, at the beginning of the project and through the end and helps us really determine the priority of what we're doing. Yeah, and I've seen the teams just say, well, that doesn't align with the vision. They actually remember it, you know, four Developers, or five scr yeah. scrums in, four or five sprints in. They actually remember that, you know, a new, new feature request doesn't align with the original vision. So that's healthy. Absolutely. So we also um, then take, you know, that after that vision statement, we'll gather high-level feature sets. And this looks like, um, it can look like a variety of things depending on who we're working with. This is just an example of, of and we're giving you a little bit of preview of how we actually then further break that out. But sometimes it's kind of a one-liner with a little bit of a description. Sometimes we have a little bit more context there. But the idea is let's get the whole feature set of the project. It may not be every single thing that we're going to do, but let's, let's bound this thing. Let's figure out what it is and what it isn't so that we can start having the conversation about scope. And you know, given that we work with deadlines, we'll often start with the date and then get into the project. And so the, really the best way then to manage that is either through um, resources. That's, you know, that's one option that we don't have. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, don't always have. And uh, the other way is through scope. And it's not eliminating large chunks of scope. It's eliminating scope of, of uh, pieces along the way. And a great example of that, uh, and I just like this example because it ha happens quite often, is w one of the first requirements most of our partners ask for is a photo gallery. And one of the first, <laughs> one of the first requirements we got when we were doing, and by the way, this is uh, most of these uh, Images are coming from our actual one of our actual projects, NBC.com. There's a redesign of NBC.com. Uh, one of the first things they said before we really got started with them was, "We need a photo gallery," and they thought that was the requirement. They had they were perfectly happy and satisfied with. We gave you a requirement; just build it. And they had a comp for what they that did photo have an image. They had a picture like. of it. Yeah. But but what they've learned really soon a thereafter, when we said that's not really a requirement, what do you mean? You know what what do we actually mean by that? Well. How many images go into the photo gallery? What sizes are they? Where do they come from? What happens when we don't have a license for something? What happens when uh, something's not available any longer? What happens when you click on it? You can imagine all of the things that can happen when you have photos in a gallery and what, what can come up. They were actually happy that we actually did that because 
previously people would take that I want a photo gallery and build them something that more likely than not didn't satisfy their need. But someone took the assumption, though, well, I think this is what you mean. And we actually say, wait, we don't want to think what you mean. We want to know what you mean. Even if it's not perfect, we can interact with it. Uh, and then we could talk about changing it. So that's a good example of a high-level feature. Might start out with photo gallery, but then we'll decompose very quickly into more detail. Once again, what's critical for us is that we are estimating and planning all throughout the life cycle of this project, starting from the very beginning. We're starting with very high-level estimates, what we call t-shirt sizing. So small, medium, and large. We have a very good idea based on some uh, team performance and velocity and the types of work we're doing. So remember, we're, once we're on a centralized platform, we're going to be doing similar types of work. So it makes it a little easier for us to then project what certain other things will be like. So NBC.com took X to do this thing. Another partner will take a similar amount of time to do a similar thing. So we can project in a high level out early. And then as we move into the project, we're decomposing into more granular estimates. So we go from t-shirt sizing to Fibonacci sequence story point sizing to get our velocities. And then when we do the work, we get into tasks. Uh, and so we're at the actual effort level of uh, effort when we're working during an iteration, we're doing hours. So we get go along the whole way doing that. Um, and the way this sort of translates to the team is that we're doing what I like to call just-in-time planning. So at a high level, we're really tr our goal there is really to try and get an understanding of how big this project is. You know. Largely, is it going to fit in the time frame that we have? How many resources do we need? Where do we need to look to sort of leverage more of what another team did, et cetera? When we get into story sizing, now we actually have a consumable, uh, digestible requirement that we're actually going to share with the team. And the idea there is to get them to ask questions and talk about it. When we get into the task level, everybody's clear on what we're doing, and we're really just sort of laying out a plan for our iteration. So it's just in time planning. It's not doing that task level at the beginning of the project. It's yeah. doing it just when we're ready to start executing on that. Yeah, and th at the task level, I like that the team agrees to the commitment. That's right, that's right. Not any one person. So uh, one example of this is really, it's th I know this is hard to see, but I'll show you another slide in a moment. But this is, once again, we do these exercises with our teams to actually elaborate and get <laughs> this information. So uh, earlier you saw one of the vision, and we get, we'll often get very long vision statements that basically have a lot more information in them. That's part of the one we saw. This, although you really can't see it, is actually our a, the a very early in a project planning, uh, kind of elaborating on how long some of these big sections will take from the t-shirt size point of view. Basically what this is is then put into something like this. So we've translated it into yeah. uh, this. Yeah, so you know, this again, uh, still a little bit high level. This is not a pr Microsoft project plan that has every task written out, but this is enough. This is enough for us to sort of set a date, um, to understand you know, the, the how much time, and this ultimately leads into what I call sort of giving each feature set an allowance. You know, If we're restricted by a date and resources, we're gonna control scope, right? So we wanna really focus on what the priority is of something, and sort of give more, an allow more of a, an allowance to that feature set. And then things that are lower priority, you know, it doesn't mean we're not going to get them done, but we're just not going to spend a lot of time on them. And this is sort of the <coughs> beginning of starting to, you know, put that together, very high level still. We also have to remember that we have executive level sponsorship and support. Very often, regardless of the methodology we're following, people want to have an idea that they're comfortable, that we're going to hit dates, that we have things laid out, that things are planned for. Once again, we're still agile. We're be being very flexible about what we're doing, when we're doing it managing by scope, but that doesn't preclude us from needing to actually plan things out a little more elaborately than you often see in, in some Agile projects. And again, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing because we're using a common <coughs> platform, some of these things are repeatable. So we can, in some sense, um, start putting this together and really getting, giving the, the brand kind of a, a good idea of what the, the project's going to look like. So we're really, as we move forward from those high level, I just want a photo gallery, we move into more detailed requirements, uh, detailed stories that actually start talking about uh, not only what we're doing, but the acceptance criteria for delivering them. And we just came from a session talking about, <coughs> excuse me, BDD, Behavior Driven Development, which we very much support. <coughs> and our acceptance criteria, although we, we aren't doing a formal BDD yet, we write our acceptance criteria so that we can actually, number one, and very well define when we're done with delivering something, but also we start with those uh, as a platform for our testing. So it gets into a lot of decomposition as we go. Along with the more detailed stories, at this point in our project, we're also getting 
wireframes. And the difference between a wireframe and a comp is that this is not a definite thing that we're going to deliver. We don't want to ever <laughs> have our partners confuse a finished looking picture with what they're actually going to get online. I mean, we haven't st we've just started doing um, in-browser design, and I think that's really a great step forward to what we're doing. When we're working in a certain platform, we believe that it's best to move towards showing people what things are going to look on that platform as opposed to a piece of paper. Number one, it's interactive, but number two, what's on paper doesn't always translate very well into what people are going to get at the end, and we don't want to them to have a poor, poorly conceived misconception of what they're going to actually get. So our rule is that the requirement is what comes first. The wireframe is actually a visualization of the words of the requirement. We know because we work with teams uh, actually all over the world, and we work with teams that speak many languages, that a, a picture is very important for us to be able to translate our words correctly. So it's critical that, not, that we have them, but we don't want to confuse the picture with the, the written requirement. We also want to make sure that it's easily updated because depending on whether we have a UX resource on the team or not, and often we don't, we might have to update a requirement. We want to be able to update the picture as quickly because that will be the default that people work from. So uh, I, again, this theme of breaking things down. So uh, once we get into actually writing stories, now we can actually start to lay these stories out, maybe even epics, which are sort of high level themes um, across iterations. And what this, again, helps enforce is um, how does this how does this go uh, uh, how does this um, align to our timeline um, the other thing that we like to do is um, in this actual example we're actually using two teams to execute mm -hmm. on the project uh, but we also have things prioritized for our core team and we also have things that our support team is is executing on as well so again yes we're using an agile process but you know there is a lot of planning that needs to go on when you're working across multiple teams. Um, and really the key is to define this stuff, start breaking it down in such a way, and again, that just-in-time planning, which is getting at the level of detail that you need at the right time. So just to reiterate, this goes from this, which is a very high-level plan, to this, which is a more detailed plan. I think that we've all seen, and, and since, since we're doing this for a while now, um, and we're doing, but we're doing with a lot of folks for the first time, that there are a little bit surprised with the amount of work that has to go into just setting this up, just getting good requirements, just really getting to the level of planning that they really want that's accurate. It's very easy to give someone a plan that looks like this and not really map to it, not actually deliver to it. It's really not that easy to <laughs> deliver to this, and we, people expect that we will. Uh, so that's the big, one of the big challenges for us. Development, developing something is expensive. Working out some of these planning issues, working out better requirements, is a lot less expensive than trying to figure out what we want what, through building it. Yeah. So that's one of the things. And the, and the other thing I just wanted to add is that my team's uh, publisher roadmap is influenced by the various implementation planning that happens, right? So if I see common threads where three or four brands need a certain uh, type of functionality, I'll prioritize that for, for our team so that we can deliver that and build it once and then make it available for the implementations. And then, then it's less work on the implementation team as well. So there's this constant realignment of roadmaps that's happening continuously. And you know, one thing we didn't really mention, but even though we do sort of plan this out, the plans change, right? And so we need to be flexible and understand that, but having a plan and then changing it, now you know what the impact is, right? So if you didn't have a plan and you were just sort of iterating through this and hoping you would hit the date, you really wouldn't understand the impact of a change. We certainly welcome changes into our process, but at the same time, we have to understand what the impact is. And it's really our job to really educate the brands about what those, what those impacts are. And in many cases, it's multiple brands that are affected by that. So it's a, it's a big challenge, but um, <coughs> through collaboration, communication, some of the groups that we've set up um, across the organization, we're able to communicate that um, and you know, to some, le le some degree get a little bit of buy-in on that. Right, so we're going from the defining process, which is the beginning of our project life cycle, where we're setting up, making sure we have really good requirements, making sure we decompose to have enough information to start measuring <coughs> and be able to deliver. And now we're going into our delivery phase, which encompasses our setting up our environments, making sure our teams are fully in place, um, doing our release planning as we were just doing, and now we're really doing development. 
And once again, we're always thinking about delivering benefit and value uh, and managing by scope to make sure that we fit in the timelines that we're looking for. I think one of the, you know, besides requirements, I think one of the most important things that we are doing is really setting up the right team structure. And this is hopefully, um, it's a very sort of complicated diagram, but it really explains sort of how we, um, how we have teams, different teams doing different activities. Um, and again, this is across a large organization. So in some cases, we're working with multiple teams are the output of one particular team's work. So it's really important that we have teams of people and not individuals. So you know, first we have sort of a large team of people who are working on requirements. We have uh, you know stakeholders. We have designers. We have um, requirements engineers, which is kind of our our uh, a little bit more than a, a business analyst. Um, all of these people are contributing with our product owner and with our brands to produce requirements. We then have, um, and this is typically for a large um, project. We then have. Um, tech leads, um, sometimes it's usually multiple tech leads on a project, um, so that they can help sort of uh, set the approach, right? As, as all of you know, with Drupal, there's a million ways to do one thing. Um, we're trying to create not only uh, use a standard platform, use a standard process, but really down into how we're implementing the approach that we're taking on certain things. We want that to be <coughs> somewhat consistent, and we do that with um, our tech leads and our tech leads talking to one another and working closely together and then that can sort of uh, that approach really spans out uh, to the teams. So once again it's it looks complex and maybe a little complex but uh, it is complex a little bit it's not yeah. so simple just to say we have a I think it's order. complex because it is complex. Well it is I, yes I guess <laughs> I guess you could say it but once again people don't realize sometimes and, and this il illustrates it there is some complexity going on here we're being very diligent to manage it in a way that it's is opaque to our end users. We don't want people to have to worry about this. We manage this so that once again our, our partners and our clients and our end users, they don't have to deal with this so we do. Yeah, and so we can answer those original questions like when will it be done? Right. right. We can accurately answer that. And we've organized our teams, and, and James alluded to this, in a way that we've actually created a position for people just to help get requirements done because we found that one of our gaps in our organization, and frankly I found on many projects through the years, is that we often work faster than the amount of, of consumable requirements we have ready to go. And so we created a group of people that just help build the backlog so that we have consumable requirements for the teams all of the time. It's, it's something that they, just, that they only focus on that. So this is a, an actual sample of one of the iteration. Our iterations are two weeks. This is really our day-to-day -day schedule. And it's consistent. So every, every day, everybody knows what meetings are happening, what, where we are in the process, what everybody should be focusing on. And the interesting thing is that we actually, in that two-week process, we're actually starting at the end of the iteration. We're starting to plan for the next iteration. And that really is, um, can be challenging. Uh, and it, it turns out that developers and testers actually like sort of a consistent schedule. Um, imagine that. So by having a rig rigorous schedule and really sort of moving heaven and earth to get everything in by the, that time and keeping the meetings is really important to us because that way we can create consistency um, and really and all of and predictability and yeah. all of this is really around that predictability. You know, we find that once we start delivering, while we still have that end date, sometimes we have brands that have create sort of artificial deadlines within that project. And we find that once we start delivering every two weeks and there's transparency and they really know to expect, oh, at the demo, I'm going to see yep. these 20 things that the team is working on and I know I'm going to see exactly that. A lot of those other deadlines sort of vanish and we start having different conversations. And then we can start talking about you know, versus are you going to meet that date? When am I going to get it? We can start relaxing a little bit and start talking about what's the best thing that we can be doing and really start moving yeah. that around. And, you know, that's, that's really, you know, I think all of us here we, uh, in the, uh, one of the presentations we saw this morning, somebody mentioned that, um, you know, we don't just do what we do just to, sometimes we do it for a paycheck or keep ourselves occupied to keep ourselves out of trouble during the day, right? But I think all of us are here focused on quality, right? And so if we can build quality into our process um, and really allow for, you know, changes and, and the, sort of the best possible approach to things to come forward, 
you know, then we're doing our job. Yeah, the only thing I would add to this slide is that I think predictability breeds trust with our brands, and that's something we've struggled with for a number of years is getting the brands to just really trust that when we say something's going to be delivered every two weeks, it actually is. And by having that predictability, it actually helps with that trust factor. So continuing, we're decomposing further into our Yeah, so this process. is just another look at, um, you know, that last step we said. So we have our, you know, our high level sizes. We get into stories. Now we're down at the task level. And, you know, task level is really, we have it broken down, understood. And we're really just trying to map out how our, um, how our teams are going to execute across that two-week sprint. Two weeks is not a lot of time, especially when we're talking about developing and testing um, in that time frame and being completely production ready. doesn't mean we're always going to production, but it does mean production ready. So that means we're breaking things down maybe smaller than some, some, some of you are used to. That's okay. Um, maybe we're um, you know, having more people involved in developing one feature. Right? That's not so bad. Uh, maybe we're trying to build you know, better test cases early on and leverage test cases that other teams have used and also other functionality that other teams have used. These are all good things. And uh, you know, that's really, we really drive it through this, um, what I call aggressive um, uh, iteration schedule. And of course, this is also where we're applying during our delivery phase, our visual design. We haven't forgotten them, but when wireframes were enough to start in the beginning to really get started and working and make sure we're delivering the overall framework of what we're building, we have in parallel the designers working on the actual design we're going to apply. So we haven't forgotten it. We just want to make sure that the, the design isn't driving the, the features yeah, and functionality. that's not the requirement. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we, we can build without <clears throat> this. We don't need this, right? We can start building uh, back-end functionality, even front-end sort of uh, how we're going to use that, right? This is all theming and styling, right, at this level. And we can do that later in the project. And that's sort of where, um, you know, that, that's, that's great because now our designers can really see what it sort of looks like, what that functionality looks like, and what our interactions are going to be, and start doing that work um, once they sort of deliver us um, pictures. Um, and, uh, yeah. Also... Well, this, you know, you can start. You want to talk, talk about this one? No, you want no, to start? No. The mo one of the other most important things, although they're all pretty important and one of the things that we, we really feel are really important, are the metrics we're getting out of this. So from the process perspective, I'm looking for certain things out of these. I'm looking to make sure that uh, we're delivering consistent velocities, that we are, are addressing the numbers that we're seeing, and that I, uh, being responsible for process, make sure that um, I'm adjusting the process where I see anomalies in the metrics or the, some of the metrics tell me something about where the process might not be working very well. Um, each of us, and, and James and Chris will elaborate, use these same metrics for different things. Uh, so we're actually you know, creating a lot of numbers, but we're actually getting something out of it. So Yeah, and you know, I would say you know, we, we definitely use like a, a team's velocity to understand um, you know, predictability, right? If we know a team can consistently deliver X amount of points per iteration, that helps us with our, our obviously even our high level plan, but also our detailed planning, um, and then defects as well helps us really sort of control the the quality that that's happening in the iteration. But you know, the the other thing I want to mention on this is that this is kind of all that we track. You know, we don't get into a lot of really fancy um, uh, spreadsheets and you know diagrams and whatever. Um, keep it simple is sort of our motto. You know, just enough. These are the metrics we need now. These are the metrics we need today, and so that's really what we're tracking. I totally should have put in that keep it simple slide. Yeah, well, <laughs> just make sure you spell it right. <laughs> so ultimately, we're delivering what we said we were going to deliver at the end of the project, which actually, we're not quite at the end of NBC.com, but this is pretty close to what, it, you know, something close to what it might look like in the future. But the fact is, <laughs> delivered doesn't mean done. And so this is part of the process that we want to make sure. So, you know, once again, we're in a large company. We're delivering value, not just a product at the end. So once we've delivered this, the next part of the process actually begins, which is measuring our benefit and support. And we often forget that, that even though the development phase might be over and the team might be rolling off of this, the business is still obviously very much involved. We're now delivering something. Once this goes in front of our audience, once this, people start using this, <coughs> we're going to have to start measuring whether or not we're achieving the goals we set for this. So this goes back to the vision. Our vision usually includes some of the goals we've set for this, this redesign or this project. 
And so basically what we're saying is, is once we've moved to a new platform, we want people to do this more or do this less or go here more or experience this. Now we get to start to measure that. So that's really important for us. We're measuring the benefits. So once again, the business is looking to see if they're getting out of this, what they expected. Once again, if we're already in production, if we're delivering every two weeks, we can track this all of the time. Tracking functionality is something inherent in support, making sure things are working. Uh, we start gathering feedback again because now people are using it, so we're getting something out of it. And creating user stories, so we're back to the backlog creation. Yeah, and each one of the uh, projects that we work on for each one of the brands have their own backlog. My, my core team has a backlog as well, and they're all influenced by each other. And the point is, and the reason why we had that slide titled Not Done, is that at the end of the project, we want to regroom our backlog mm -hmm. and take another look at it and sort of start again and make sure that we're in a good place to deliver more value to each of the brands that are using the product and more about value to those brands themselves. You know, it's interesting because it, you know I'm in, I'm in charge of the projects and actually implementing them, but that's really sort of the beginning, right? At the end of a project is really the beginning, right? So now we have a community, right? We have a community of, of internal developers. So, you know, some of the brands have their own smaller teams that they use. We have an internal community of, of end users, and now we have a community of, you know, of visitors out there that are all using the same platform. So really, at the end of the day, this is the beginning, and now we're really all part of a, a larger group, um, which is uh, exciting. <laughs> yeah. So to summarize, um, I think what's what's the message we're trying to get across to you today is really that this process, although it is complex, it's really designed to uh, deliver on these five areas, which is a scalable platform in, f in the form of our publisher product that delivers common functionality to all of our brands so that these things are built once and reused. And that's the point of the second bullet, which is reusable parts that come out of the, pu the publisher core team, as well as functionality that's built during an implementation that could be used for for uh, an, impl an implementation that's built for brand A could be used for brand B, right? So uh, on NBC.com, if they're building something that Oxygen could use, we want to be able to reuse that. Defining your requirements, obviously, I think we all know how important that is. We put a particular emphasis on requirements in our organization, mostly because we've been doing this a long time and we know that without requirements, we really can't build anything and we can't project with any certainty when something is going to be done, which is all that you know our brand leaders ultimately care about. Um, the relationships and collaboration, obviously we're here at DrupalCon and we've been coming for several years. Um, we want to participate not only and collaborate not only internally within, within each team, but between teams and with our brand leaders as well as with editorial uh, personnel throughout the company. That's a lot of collaboration and a lot of communication that has to happen, but one of the things that I've really become fond of is the fact that talk is a lot cheaper than development, so um, we, we put a, a heavy emphasis on that as well. And then the metrics that Adam mentioned just help us refine <coughs> and improve our process and make sure it's sort of like a gut check to make sure that we are delivering value to each one of our brands and we are delivering value to the company. If we build something once, we want to measure the effectiveness of that functionality by seeing how many times it's used, how, al how long it took to build, and what that value really is at the end of the day. So I think two things are important. Uh, well, uh, one most important thing is when we started this, I don't think, uh, which was a while ago, a couple of years ago we started implementing this, uh, not everyone was buying into it. Not everyone was sure this was going to work. And one of the uh, gratifying parts of this is now that we've been doing it for a while, especially with new folks that have never worked this way before, we're getting a lot of uh, satisfied customers. They're telling us that they appreciate the way we're doing things, that it's a little more painful in the beginning. And usually we're getting a little pushback at the beginning, but um, we're really pushing them a little bit more than they pr may have been pushed in the past. They're getting good results out of it. And really, ultimately, it's getting the result we're looking for. You know, a lot of this revolves around estimating and planning and really having a good process uh, in place to do that. So actually, just to mention that James and I tomorrow... Plug, total plug, <coughs> coming up. <laughs> tomorrow, James and I are holding a BOF for just to talk about estimating and planning. Uh, we could talk about what we're doing, but we'd also like to hear what other people do because that's really one of the, the biggest challenges that we have is really uh, refining and getting better estimating and planning. So please um, come to that. And uh, that's it for today. We'll take yeah. questions. So, so yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, we we try to use uh, simple tools. We're using Rally mostly, 
for managing our iterations and managing our requirements. Um, we're trying to use it to, uh, we also use it for our metrics as well. We're trying to use it for some of our sort of pre-planning, but it doesn't really do a good job. So we're really using homemade custom spreadsheets at this point. Yeah. Um, there just aren't tools out there, but uh, you know, once we develop them. I think Rally's a little <laughs> bit better on the product side for release planning, but yeah. not on the implementation side. Yeah. Can everyone hear? Because we could. Re you I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Oh, you know, actually, that mic we could pass around. I yeah. Guess. yeah. Um, the question was, how big is the core team, and how long did it take to release the the initial version? Um, the core team now is about twenty people, and that's all in. That's requirements, dev, QA, um, product people, um, project management as well. Um, and it took really before the s the product was ready for the first site to build on top of. It took close to a year. And that was, uh, there was a little bit of faith that this company certainly gave us to build that core product. But by using this process that, that we've been talking about today to build the product itself, um, there was a lot of trust that was gained through predictability. Yeah. We didn't start that large either. It was no, a little bit no. smaller. It was probably about 10 or 12 in the beginning. Um, but then s because we had some good metrics, we were able to project that we probably needed a little bit more help in order to leverage it for all brands, which was the goal all along. Mm. Other questions? Sure. Over here. Go ahead. Uh, oh. oh, please. We'll get to you next. Excellent question. So the, qu the question was, you know, if we're measuring velocity and we have so much pressure from the brand leaders, how do we uh, h handle that communication and that pressure? Yeah. Um, you know, to me, I feel like we handle it through transparency. We don't push back. We let them make those decisions. We're just very transparent about what the velocity is of the team, what we think they can deliver in a certain period of time and let those brand leaders uh, make those decisions themselves. We don't want to force their, force their hand in any way. And I when think it, that's the best method, quite when frankly. It, yeah, when it works well, the, the brands, our partners, make those decisions. So Bef we have Before they even come up, actually. So we had, on this very project, NBC.com, when we started with the scope of the project, we knew that there, that there were things that we knew would they be were out crazy. of scope. They were just too big <laughs> for us to have. Well, I don't know if we thought they were crazy, but we knew that they were probably bigger than what we can handle. Even at the beginning, we had an idea. And, uh, but, but the partner, to their credit, said, no, we want to keep them in. We, we understand. We, we hear you. We may not believe you, right? Mm. Which is fine. They're really running this, their product. They're the business. But over time, when we were delivering consistently, they saw that they were getting good quality. They saw that we were legitimately working as hard as we could. We were delivering maximum amount of, of stuff. They started to realize for themselves that we weren't going to get all of these things. Yeah, and, the, and that it was true, right? And what we were saying and, was true. And they literally took out everything we had said probably should have be, be taken out in the beginning. But they, at that point, realized it for themselves. It's very helpful to us when they do that. They also knew that we could add some another team which we w to add capacity. That's always a possibility. Um, but the fact is, you, you're const always constrained by something. And so the constraint is either the amount of things we can do or add more people to do it, which adds to complexity, which doesn't mean you're going to get everything still. So uh, ultimately, we're just being very transparent about what's re reality is, is, is the killer here because traditionally people are, are led to believe they're going to get everything or they've been yes to death. Oh, yeah, no problem. We'll get it for you. Oh, no, that's not going to be a problem. And when they don't, it's quite a disappointment, and rightly so. But we're saying, look. We're going to give you everything we can give you, and we want to make sure we do the important things first, which is, by the way, also a different way of doing things. People aren't used to having to make choices, even though they, they should be, right? So there's always a finite amount of time or capacity or something. Yet in the past, people have just for some reason felt, well, we're just going yeah. to get everything at some point. We're not going to get everything at some point. And so we're being realistic about that up yeah. front. It's, so. a, it's uncomfortable right. in the beginning for some of these folks that haven't worked with us in the past or haven't worked this way ever. Um, but ultimately, over time, I feel like that uncomfortability goes away. 
Yeah, it's also you know about breaking things down even further. Nine times out of ten, something that is big, the team will come back and say, "Well, that's pretty complex." As we break it down, we can have additional discussions, and that goes really a long way. So if, if, if things seem too big, where they want to get more work in, a lot of times we break things down a little bit further, and we find out that they're a little bit more digestible too. The, the velocity is the, um, is the result of the team. So it's not something that we control. It's a metric that tells us uh, uh, about predictability, right? And so we can actually, if, if you know, in that slide, w you'll see sort of some dips and things like that. I can tell you, you know, almost, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's reasons behind everything. The 131, we had some vacations. Uh, Dennis, I think you were out on vacation. Uh, <laughs> 127, we still had people on vacation. So there's reasons why the velocity dips, but pr predicting that throughout your project gives you the ability to have that conversation about prioritization, scope, um, and you know uh, that that goes a long way. Yeah, th that number is just a reflection of the point sizes that they were able to deliver, yeah. not not hours. Yeah, and then we have conversations like, what would a second team? How would that help us? What if we move these feature sets into core? What if we leverage something that somebody else used? You know, to yeah. start really, these are all conversations that we can have rather than, hey, can't you just have the team work faster? You know, I, I think I heard that one the other day. Oh yeah, more hours there. Oh, we had a question back here. For We call it James. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we need the picture of me on the four phones. Yes. Um, any, anything and everything, I think, is the answer. Yeah. I mean, pr pr primarily, we Case. do a lot of meetings, right? But yeah. um, for a lot of the uh, planning meetings for these projects, they have to be, people have to be either be in person or online. So WebEx and teleconference calls, we do a lot of that. For some of our larger projects where we're fortunate to be able to use things like video conferencing, we do that as well. So anything we can, to, we really want to um, foster that collaboration as much as possible. And we're pretty religious uh, Basecamp users yeah. um, and IRC as well. Yep. So in, in your point of view, which are the, like the, the skills that you would look in a project manager? If you were hiring someone new for, mm. for your organization that fits you know, your, your methodology and, and what really matters to you? Because the word project manager might have so many skills. Mm. Yeah, you that's know, a good question. What three are the, the, the ones that really matter? I, I think first of all, it's somebody who's done this before, so done <laughs> some level of agile. Um, hopefully it's somebody who's sort of done it obviously successfully, but really with kind of a team that was co-located, because we're not co-located. We have teams all around the world. But having that as a reference point for a project manager and what they're driving towards is really important. Having that vision of like, you know, this is what the team should look like, even though I may never get there, this is how we should be operating and constantly driving. So experience with, um, with Agile, um, and, but flexible enough to realize that, we actually stopped calling our process Agile because everybody has their own yeah. idea of Agile. So we just call it the process. It's the process. Um, but it's, you know, it's based on sort of Scrum uh, uh, and other Agile principles. Um, I think also we look for technical project managers. So somebody who we don't need to really dive into code, but somebody who really understands when a developer says, I have this block, I need it removed. We, like you what need to understand yeah. the severity of that, right? And you may need to be able to talk to other teams in some cases and go to, you know, talk to the architects on other teams and say, hey, listen, you know, we've got this problem, you know? So you need, you need, you need those skills. And really somebody who is, um, you know, incredibly good at communication. Um, that's really, those, those would, I would say, be, be the top three. Up front. Um, so you, you customize Agile and you call it the process. Mm. But when that project manager that you're looking for walks in the door, they need to learn that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what made you customize it? Well, we, our philosophy is... It's still based on the it, principles well, of Agile. If, yeah. if, you, if you've done Scrum, you'll recognize what we're doing. It's not a completely different thing. We use uh, mo men, much of the language of Scrum, um, Lean and Kanban. A lot of, basically, it's Scrum, Lean, you know, very Lean thinking and Kanban. So it's, it's not like there's no lexicon for what we're doing. But in reality, what we felt, and, and James and I have been doing 
actual agile implementations for a while, is that um, we, we wanted to make a process that fit in the organization. So our organization, this process would work pretty much everywhere, but it might be tweaked again for a different type of organization. So what we've done is fit things to work agilely within an organization that isn't necessarily all agile and nor really understands agility at all levels. So just now we're starting to interface with upper management and understanding maybe we can actually help them project and do budgeting with some of the numbers we're having because we're getting that consistent at things where most years and most places will just you know do their yearly guess for the next year's budget. So we're, we're just applying things. But what we found over the years just from our Agile experience, and I've been doing Agiles before Scrum, right? So before even Scrum was Scrum, that uh, one methodology doesn't necessarily scale or fit all of our needs. And so we don't want to be not Agile, but we want to find what's maybe a best of methodology that fits in. We, what I like to tell people is I know when it's not Agile, yeah. right? And that's what we really want to do. And part of what we're responsible for also is training people on the, so we actually do a three-day training course at the beginning, that it, so everyone's starting from the same place. And the reality is that Scrum and Agile don't do a good job describing how you work with global teams. They just say, you don't do it, right? But the reality is we do. Um, and I think we're successful in that. And so we, I wouldn't say that we've changed it. We really take that, and it's, it's more of a broader uh, sort of process that goes into more detail into things like, this is how you write a requirement, this is the type of meetings that you have, this is how you work with global teams, et cetera, this is how you work across two teams. These are things that really the Agile community hasn't defined and pe things that people are struggling with. And really, if you think about Scrum, and most people are familiar with Scrum, depending on who you speak with and some of the founders of Scrum, and they've changed their point of view over time as well, uh, they, some of them say, well, we didn't say these things, but we didn't mean that you ignore them, like architecture, for instance. And some people say, if it's not in the book, Scrum doesn't do it. Project management isn't part of Scrum. But project management is necessary to, in our organization to run a successful project. So what is, how can we make that an agile thing? Requirements have a standard form, which we've learned from Scrum as a user, which we use. But we, we extrapolate. We actually take the benefit statement and make that a separate line so that we can actually force people to think through what we're going to measure later. So it's not mixed in with something. It's, it's separate. So we've just tweaked it a little bit to kind of highlight what we think is important in the process. Do you want to try that one? You, you I don't know if I. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that what we're trying, so we're just starting basically to implement this idea of business value now. So we haven't been doing it for a very long time. We're just at the point. So what's great about our process is it's evolved at, since we've been there. And the focus on business value is actually something that's organically happening within the organization. So we're actually now starting to focus more about what it really means to have business value what it is we're going to measure. So we actually use the semantics of a benefit is something that you can actually measure a trend or see. So if I have, well, I'll start with a value. A value is a de definitive number. So if I have the goal of increasing X by 10% or, or, or advertising revenue, de or decreasing something by a number, 10 million, 100 million, that's a value that we can measure. So every iteration we can measure to see if what we're doing is actually working within the organization. A benefit is, is less measurable. It's more like, I want people to watch more videos. I want people to go to this page more. So the first thing we're doing is introducing the difference between a value and a benefit to the organization. And now we're actually just starting to look at how our partners are me measuring things so they can actually take advantage of this. So these are numbers that we're just starting to introduce because not that they weren't important before, but people weren't using them. And so this is something that's actually new in our organization, uh, especially since we're able now people are buying into the process so they're buying into some of the results of the process yeah, and i think the value is a little bit easier to uh, measure on the product side to a certain degree because you could say you know did this save the editor time in publishing this type of content or did it you know was it reused on a number of different sites uh, without any added uh, development time right so that's a value that can be measured but we don't have a lot of control over the performance of a website in terms of monetary performance or traffic, right? That's all a very complex thing that we don't control, but we can start to measure against that. <laughs> and we want our, our partners who do control it or have more control over it to really start thinking about it. So when we say something's not done, from our organizational point of view, once our thing is delivered, we are kind of done. 
but we want them to know that there's something more, that these metrics are important. So we're building that into the culture of the company more than we, so it's a great question. I hope next year I have an actual definitive answer <laughs> with results for you. Okay. Yeah. And a formula. I think we got time for one more. Sure. So at the, uh, at the task level, we're, it's really, at this point, we have the stories, the requirements broken down, and it's really, you know, how much time am, am I going to spend on that? And yeah, it's, it's a little bit of group effort. In some cases, we'll have sort of a lead uh, work with some of the other people that are more junior um, to sort of, you know, uh, share their experiences and, and say, yeah, I think this will probably take you this amount of time. But the... But the important thing is that they're having a conversation about it. And you know, you can't just sit down and say, oh, I'm going to build this module. I think it, I need this task and that task. And the, it's really about yeah. a conversation that you're having over and over and over again, first with your product and requirements team, and then with your peers on the, on the development side to really understand <laughs> what that is. And at the end, what we get is that on that first day of the iteration, people are sitting down and writing code instead of like sort of you know, thinking spending a lot it, of time yeah. thinking about it and dreaming about what this module could be because we've already done that. We've done that ahead of time. So yeah, yeah and the whole team has to agree on that on that number, right? That size, including the testers who have to test it. So so, yeah. so with your lead developer, Ren, do you estimate like uh, I don't know, half days for him instead of like six hour days? <coughs> so it, that's actually interesting. That so the leads are kind of uh, in a some of them certainly participate more in the iteration than others. Um, it really depends on the team size. Some of them are literally coding and in the team, and some of them are more mentors dealing with upgrades to core, um, dealing with um, you know planning and architecting and figuring out what modules um, we're going to use. Um, and so for their time, we're not really interested. We don't really track that um, necessarily in the iteration. When we're tracking our tasks in the iteration, what we're really trying to figure out is how are we going to get this work done given you know, all the tasks that we have to complete and what's our path to do that, including testing. So it really helps us do more like plan out two weeks. So and then the leads, we really sort of uh, just overwork them to death, you know? <laughs> right. Well, that's good, thanks, because I thought we were doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everybody, thank for coming. Thank you very we much. Appreciate yeah, thanks it. a lot, everybody.